LinkedIn presents. I'm Rufus Griscom, and this is The Next Big Idea. Today, Stuart Russell, one of the leading pioneers of artificial intelligence, says we may see the arrival of superior alien intelligence, but it won't be arriving in a spaceship. We're in the process of building it. Sometimes I get fixated on something new that I don't understand. Right now, it's artificial intelligence. I'm obsessed with it, like a dog with a bone, because it feels like something we need to understand. A few years ago, AI was just a cool idea that was starting to be useful, improving language translation and recommendation algorithms. In the last year, in the last few months, it's become something else entirely. It's, it's writing code, novels, legal contracts, and powering thousands upon thousands of new venture-backed startups. On the one hand, I find this AI explosion just really exciting. It reminds me of a few other times in my lifetime when transformative technologies have opened up new vistas, new playgrounds, offering potentially career-transforming opportunities. Over the course of my life, I've sometimes taken advantage of these moments and sometimes I've just missed them. I'm thinking of the emergence of the first personal computers in the 70s and 80s, the advent of the internet in the 1990s, and the explosion of social media in the 2000s. I remember first seeing the internet emerge slowly over a friend's shoulder on his Mosaic web browser, a precursor to Netscape. It was pixelated and sluggish, but it was clear that this was going to be a game changer. Though I was slow to become interested in personal computers as a kid, I missed that opportunity. I was into video games and Dungeons and Dragons. I did take advantage of the emergence of the web, launching Nerve.com, an early online magazine, in 1997. It was exhilarating, surfing a wave of new tech-enabled possibility, powered by swelling collective engagement. This moment to me feels exactly like that time, which is to say large language models may be to the 2020s what HTML was to the 1990s. There are moments when, in a relatively short amount of time, it's possible to get up to speed on these new platforms because, frankly, no one yet understands their potential or the applications. So we are pursuing it. We're developing a new set of AI-powered tools for the Next Big Idea app and website. We want to help people navigate the world of ideas and unlock the potential locked in thousands of books with the help of AI. I'm also, to be candid, afraid. The level of concern we're hearing from leaders in AI development the people who understand this technology better than anyone, the people who built it, the people running the companies poised to make trillions of dollars exceeds anything I've seen in my lifetime. Not just concern about political polarization or social alienation, but concern about the possible termination of our species. With all these interests in mind, there is no one better to talk to this week than Stuart Russell who runs the Center for Human-Compatible Artificial Intelligence at UC Berkeley. Stewart is one of the pioneers of artificial intelligence, contributing critical research in the last several decades on probabilistic reasoning, knowledge representation, real-time decision-making, computer vision, and inverse reinforcement learning. He co-authored the definitive textbook on AI in 2009, Artificial Intelligence, A Modern Approach. In 2019, he published a book for the rest of us, Human Compatible, Artificial Intelligence, and the Problem of Control, which is being re-released soon with a new afterword. Nobel Prize winner Daniel Kahneman said it was, quote, the most important book I have read in quite some time. MIT physicist Max Tegmark called it an intellectual tour de force. And Elon Musk tweeted, worth reading. Stuart tells us what we're doing in pursuing artificial general intelligence, as we are right now, without reservation, is summoning the arrival of a superior alien intelligence. Will it be benevolent, malicious, indifferent to our interests? If we get this right, we may be able to cure all diseases, says Stuart, create boundless, free, sustainable energy, invent faster than light space travel, it may, to quote Nick Bostrom, 
lead to a compassionate and jubilant use of humanity's cosmic endowment. Quite a quote. If we get it wrong, it could be catastrophic, like scientists building a nuclear reactor without a containment system. Fortunately, many very smart people in the field are dedicating their lives to this problem. One of them is Stuart Russell. If you're interested in the story behind the business headlines, check out Big Technology Podcast, my weekly show that features in-depth interviews with CEOs, researchers, and reformers in business and technology. Hi, I'm Alex Kantrowitz. I'm a longtime journalist, CNBC contributor, and the host of the show. I empty my Rolodex every Wednesday to bring you awesome episodes. So go check out Big Technology Podcast. It's available on all podcast apps. I'd love to have you as a listener. Stuart Russell, welcome to the Next Big Idea podcast. Thank you, Rufus. Nice to be here. Four years ago in your book, Human Compatible, you said, I'm not saying that success in AI will necessarily happen, and I think it's quite unlikely that it will happen in the next few years. Are you happy to have been proven wrong? Are you frightened or both? So I don't think I've been proven wrong. So when I say success in AI there, I'm talking about the kind of general purpose AI that, uh, you know, that Alan Turing warned about in 1951. I think he said, once the machine thinking method had started, it would soon exceed our feeble powers and we should have to expect the machines to take control. So we are not there yet. Nowadays, the trendy term for that is AGI, artificial general intelligence. And I don't see anyone serious claiming that AGI is here. But a lot of people have moved their timeline a lot closer to the present, I guess at least by a factor of two for almost everybody. And some people think that the next step could happen any minute. Some people think it might take five years. I'm still a little more on the conservative side. I think there are still some major gaps and we don't understand how to fill those gaps. But certainly what's happened in the last few years is a dramatic introduction for the vast majority of lay people who weren't following what was going on. And all of a sudden, they can talk to something that talks back in a way that seems extremely intelligent. And I think actually OpenAI themselves put it quite well when they said, you know, this is not general purpose intelligence, but it gives people a foretaste of what it will be like to live in a world where general purpose intelligence is widely available for humans to access. That's a pretty good summary of the situation. Meanwhile, their partners at Microsoft uh, released a paper saying they were seeing sparks of AGI. And a number of very prudent individuals, including yourself, released an open letter calling for a six-month pause on building more powerful models than, say, GPT-4. So that would suggest a sense of, of alarm. It seems that most people were somewhat surprised by the acceleration that occurred between GPT-2, 3, and 4 in the last you know 18 months or so. Yeah, I think that's true. And I should mention, and my publisher will never forgive me if I don't, that uh, there's a new version of Human Compatible. I think the books just arrived from the printer, uh, so they should be available uh, any day now. And uh, the new version has a 30-page afterword where I update the book for what's happened between 2019 and 2023. And you know what's happened, uh, as, as we just talked about, is quite surprising to most people. And, you know, the six-month pause letter was not so much, if we don't stop now, catastrophe may strike in the next six months. It was more, now would be a good time to figure out how to regulate these systems before it's too late. And I think in that sense, the letter was very successful. We just had the six-month the six anniversary is today. Yes, I, we noted that. Amazing. 
Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I, I think it's true to say that, in fact, no system more powerful than GPT-4 has been trained and released that, that I know of. I think there are there are some other powerful systems. Falcon in the United Arab Emirates is one, but I, I don't know that they're claiming it's more powerful than GPT-4. Uh, and then Gemini at Google is another which is more of a multimodal system, but exactly, and and, and I think the Gemini, uh, the folks at Google, I, I believe, say that the uh, that it has five times the computational power of GPT four. Well, five times the it uses five times the computational resources, and that part of that is because it's designed to to operate with video input. Right, right. I and, see. You know, yeah. The brain uses most of its computational real estate for video input. Uh, because you know, because it's just a uh, an enormous torrent of data coming in, and you've got to do something with it. So it's not that surprising, but it doesn't mean that on the things that GPT four does with language that Gemini is going to be more capable than GPT four at understanding language or or solving problems that are presented to it in language. But we'll see. But anyway, I I don't think it really matters actually. You know, was the pause actually observed in practice or or not? The very next day, UNESCO sent out an urgent message to all member states, which is pretty much the entire world, saying, hurry up and get your principles turned into hard law legislation uh, so that we can control these systems. But meanwhile, in parallel, of course, the investment that's going into all these AI companies is just accelerating. I, I, I was just a couple of days ago. I was at a at a demo day of a, of a of an AI kind of Y Combinator type entity here in New York, and everyone was building on top of mostly on top of GPT, and everyone had term sheets and countless millions flowing in, and it was just you know there, there was a gleam in everybody's eye. And it, it's um, on the one hand we do have you know serious response from government. On the other hand. There's a huge amount of excitement and investment. I remember that uh, Sam Altman had said the one thing that kept him up at night was uh, a context in which we were in a race environment, and large companies were were just racing as fast as they could to out compete each other. And that's precisely what appears to be happening, right? When you when you hear about Google's Gemini release, and uh, and also just the idea that we're, that thousands and thousands of companies will be building products on top of an open API. For GPT and no doubt other other platforms, um, so it, it seems that there's there, there's cause for encouragement that regulation is being taken seriously, but also cause for increasing alarm, perhaps. Yeah, I think I think the the point about the investment flows is is absolutely valid. I mean, according to some estimates, it's about ten times the size of the entire National Science Foundation budget in the United States, which is covering all of basic research and in all of science and technology except for healthcare. That's a pretty difficult force to, to try to stop. And I have to say, until recently, I sort of rejected the idea that we could simply stop AI research um, because of the incentives to push it forward. And I would say, in fact, that the computational power we already have is actually far more than we need to create human yeah. level intelligence. Interesting. Um, the reason why we haven't is because the methods we're using are extremely weak. Yes. Yeah. And this is actually a disease we've suffered from in AI from the very beginning. In fact, there was a, I suppose still is a technical phrase, weak methods. And in the 60s, that meant methods of problem solving that relied basically on brute force. And we very quickly found out, perhaps to the surprise of some, that the fact that you can make a plan that's three steps long successfully doesn't mean you can make a plan that's 3,000 steps long successfully. In fact, the methods that they had kind of topped out at five steps or six steps because Weak method is exploring a set of possible futures that grows exponentially with the length of the future. So six steps, if you had 10 choices of what to do with each step, and you're looking at six steps, then 
that's 10 to the power of six or a million possibilities already. And, um, you know, now our hardware is maybe a quadrillion times more powerful. Um, wow. But, you know, what? so what does that do? Well, that gets you from six steps up to 21 steps, right? It doesn't get you to 3,000 steps. So we actually got to, I think, forget this idea that scaling is the solution to everything because it's not. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. There isn't enough data in the universe to train these models to function successfully in the real world unless we figure out much more intelligent ways to design the software part. Speaking to the to what's at stake here, you gave a talk in 2013 to an audience that consisted of, uh, you write, non-scientists with a general interest in intellectual matters, which sounds a lot like myself and I think many people listening. You offered five candidates for the biggest event in the future of humanity. Number one, we all die. Asteroid impact, pandemic, climate catastrophe. Number two, we all live forever, medical innovation. Number three, we invent faster than light travel and conquer the universe. Number four, we're visited by a superior alien civilization. And number five, we invent super intelligent AI. Which of these would be the biggest event in the future of humanity and why? Well, so I, I propose that in fact, it would be the last one that we invent super intelligent AI. and. Arguably, if we do, then we can quite possibly live forever. We can quite possibly invent fast and light space travel. And you know, clearly, if we do have super intelligent AI, those are much more likely to happen. So number five subsumes number two and three. It might prevent number one uh, because it would give us more advanced technology that we could use to ward off uh, large asteroids possibly detect and suppress supervolcanoes, prevent pandemics, and maybe keep the, keep the climate stable. So, and it would be similar in many ways to the arrival of a superior alien civilization. But it's much more likely, uh, as far as we know, to happen. And uh, there really isn't much we can do to cause or prevent a superior alien civilization from arriving. <laughs> right. But with AI, yeah. we can cause it we can cause it to go wrong or we can cause it to go right. Do you believe that we're in the process of inventing this super intelligent AI? You mentioned earlier that many experts have reduced by 50% their predictions for how many years it will take to build it. Um, and just to, to, to hem you in a little bit, I think in Human Compatible released four years ago, you said in the lifetime of your children or about 80 years, you thought a super intelligent AI could arrive. Would you revise your estimate in the same way that you say other experts have done? Yeah, my my timeline has shrunk considerably. There's still a great deal of uncertainty, and I think that's that's a very important point. If I'm correct in saying that scaling the amount of data and scaling the amount of compute doesn't solve the problem, and I think a lot of people, uh, including Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, a lot of people agree with that point, that we still need some breakthroughs. And those yeah. are really hard to predict. But given the amount of intellectual and financial resources going into this problem, you know, I would say in the last five years, the the investment in AI just exceeds all the investment in the entire history of the field. And it's accelerating, right? Probably over the next five years, it's going to be yeah. 10 times greater. You know, and the reason is pretty clear, right? The yeah. closer you get to AGI, the more certainty is that you're going to get there. And the upside value of AGI in the book, I estimate at, I think, 14 quadrillion dollars. Uh, so 14,000 trillion dollars. Uh, and, and in fact, the investments we've made so far, you know, not even a rounding error in, on, on that kind of scale. Right. So the investments are rational. The, the, the venture capitalists are not wrong. Yeah, I, th I think they're not wrong. And I think the, the timeline is, is getting a lot closer. So the way I think about this is that, you know, what we have with large language models clearly covers some aspects of intelligence, but 
if we think of it, if we think of creating AGI as a sort of a complicated jigsaw puzzle where we've got to uh, find the pieces and assemble the pieces, and then we'll have AGI. We've got this new piece, but we can't figure out what shape it is. Uh, and we can't figure out where it goes in the puzzle, and we can't figure out what other pieces we need to complete the puzzle. And the reason we can't figure out what shape it is, is because we don't know how it works. And that's, that's a real problem for scientific progress. So everyone is hard at work on that. And so the reason why a lot of people think it's much closer it is because they feel that fairly soon we're going to start to see you know, yet more progress on uh, you know, systems that can control robots in the real world and carry out long-term complicated behaviors like going to the shops, doing all the shopping, bringing it home, making dinner. You know, that's completely out of reach right now. But I think a lot of people think it will be completely within reach uh, in just a year or two. Wow. And that's, uh, that's really quite shocking. Though no one fully understands how these large language models work, some people like yourself understand uh, at least some of how they work much better than I do. <laughs> so I think it would be useful to maybe take 10 minutes and try to dig into how it is that these language models are working. And what I understand is it all began with this challenge of predicting the next word in a sentence based on prior words. And in order to do this, the model analyzes the probability of different word combinations. I think they call it sort of vectors. Um, and over time, the context window has gotten much larger. Do you want to expand on that? The idea of a language model is actually, it, it tells you how likely it is that you will encounter any given sequence of words. So to give you an example, right, the word birthday and the word under are roughly equally common in English text. But the word happy birthday, or so the sequence happy birthday, is much more common than the sequence happy under. So a language model would tell you that happy birthday is much, much more probable than happy under. And in fact, the, the underlying mathematical definitions of all this go back uh, you know, 110 years to a paper by a Russian mathematician called Andrei Markov, and he actually built a language model from uh, a very well-known Russian verse book called uh, Eugene Onegin. So he counted all the letter sequences in Eugene Onegin and built a big table. And then that table is the first statistical language model that we know of. So what happened was that people tried to build models where instead of just looking at pairs of words, as in happy birthday, they start looking at triples and quadruples. And what you soon find is that, you know, once, once you're up to quadruples, you can't actually build a complete table of all quadruples of English words for two reasons. One is you couldn't find enough storage to store that table. And the other is there aren't enough words in the universe to actually fill in the statistics of that table. But it turns out that a particular kind of network called a transformer just turns out to be particularly good at this kind of sequence representation and extrapolation. And with the transformer technology, all of a sudden, we started to be able to go from triples and quadruples to predicting the next word based on the previous 10 words and 50 words and 100 words. And I think GPT 3.5, which is the basis of chat GPT, is about a 3,000 word context window. And I think GPT-4 is maybe 20,000 words. So the process of training this representation, which you can still think, if you want, you can still think of it as a giant table, um, and it predicts the next word given the previous 20,000 words. The process of training simply means taking uh, vast amounts of text and moving a window along, your 20,000 word window, trying to predict the next word, and then you get to see what the next word actually is, because you've got the text. And then you use that next word to update your model to make it more likely next time that it's going to predict that word instead of a different word. And you update the model by basically tweaking the parameters of this big transformer neural network. And 
Roughly speaking, with GPT-4, we estimate, we don't really know because it's not been publicly released, that it probably has a trillion parameters or so. And if you look at the amount of compute used to train it, we're talking about making quintillions of small random perturbations to the individual parameters of this trillion parameter neural network. So what I've described is how you do the basic training for a large language model. Uh, and at the end of that, at the end of those quintillion small random perturbations, you have something that's pretty good at predicting the next word in a sequence. And so if you put in a prompt, that prompt is just a sequence of words, and it's part of a larger conversation you're having. And then the output of the system is just, you know, that prompt now forms part of the context window, and it's going to predict the next word. And if your prompt ends with a question mark, then in all the training data, when almost always, whenever there was a question mark, the next thing was an answer to that question. And so it predicts the words that typically would be used to answer the kinds of question that was in your prompt. So it looks like it's answering questions and does so pretty well. So two things to observe. First of all, how is it doing it? We haven't, well, roughly speaking, we haven't the faintest idea. We know how it was made. We don't know how it works. Second thing about large language models is that they're probably not answering questions in the way that you or I think about answering questions. Hmm. So, you know, roughly speaking, for humans, there's two types of questions, right? There's, there's the one where I say, hi, Rufus, how are you? And you say, fine, thanks, how are you? Right? You didn't really answer my question. <laughs> right, right. You a social just responded yeah. in the way that people usually respond to how are you, right? Fine, thanks, how are you? And at least in some cases, maybe most cases, that's sort of what ChatGPT is doing. The second kind of question for a human is, you know, hey, Rufus, where's your car parked? And, you know, you rack your brains, you think about, you know, what's happened in the past, you consult your mental model of the world, where are the places it's usually parked, you know, which one of those is actually consistent with what you know about the present, and, and then you, you figure it out. So you're consulting an internal model. Sometimes you consult an external model. If I say, hey, Rufus, where are your keys, right? You'll pat your pocket. And if they're there, you'll say, oh, they're in my pocket, right? And if they're yeah, not, yeah. you'll look around and say, oh, they're, they're on the table over there, right? So you're consulting an external model. You know, and that's normally what we mean by answering questions. Does ChatGPT do that? We don't know. Possibly. But there's evidence that it doesn't have an internal world model in the sense that we understand it. But at the same time, it, it, we have seen cases, I think so many of us have experienced cases of interacting with GPT-4 and being astonished by its apparent perspicacity and ability to kind of surprise with insight. Here's, yeah. here's, here's one example. I, um, you know, the, the author Robert Wright, who wrote Non-Zero and other books you may be familiar with, is writing his next book uh, is about cognitive empathy. Mm-hmm. And he did a test of cognitive empathy on GPT-4 in which he asked the following question. A student answers a question in a classroom and the teacher says, that's the worst answer I've ever heard. How is the student feeling? How are the people in the class feeling? The student has a girlfriend in the class, and there's another student who's romantically attracted to the girlfriend. How are they feeling? He poses this question to GPT-4. GPT-4 answers with a kind of brilliantly sophisticated, psychologically subtle analysis of how each of these individuals is feeling, right? Mm-hmm. Like the, uh, the student who's interested in the, in, in the girl whose boyfriend has been humiliated is experiencing a mix of delight that <laughs> maybe he has a shot at the girlfriend and <laughs> vicarious pain that he's been humiliated and so on. Was, you know, and, and, uh, and so it's, it's very hard to understand how GPT-4 could answer this question, unless it had somehow encountered it before, I guess, in its training data, without having some internal representative structure, or more specifically, 
building the beginning of a theory of mind, of, of an ability to imagine what other people are thinking, feeling, and, and planning. It is very hard to imagine how it could do that without the kind of understanding that humans have of that situation. And that's exactly the problem we face. We can't think of any other way it could happen, but that doesn't mean that therefore it's happening in the way that it would uh, for a human. And I just want to point out, actually, I mean, this is uh, this is not really to to undermine the point you're making, but there are studies showing that you know when teenagers see a teacher berating a student or telling them that they didn't do a good job, what do they think? The observing teenager thinks that the teacher has a high opinion of that student's intellect uh, because teachers are all trained not to upset the self-esteem of students. And so if a, when a teacher is praising a student, the observing teenager views that as the teacher doesn't think the student is very smart. Uh, and if they're, if they're abusing the student, they think the teacher has a high opinion of the student's intellect. So it might actually work differently in the classroom than, than GPT-4 thinks. I just want to mention one more, um, if you don't mind, just, just yeah. one more set of symptoms that suggest that not as much is going on as, as we might hope inside these systems. And that's uh, what's happened with arithmetic. Oh, yes. Yes. So, you know, adding up numbers is something that, you know, kids learn to do at an early age. And, they, you know, they, they need a few practice examples. You go, go look at a typical um, early elementary school uh, math book, and you will see that, you know, for adding and subtracting and multiplying, there are, you know, maybe 50 or 100 training examples and, and the kids have to do those and they get the hang of it, most of them. And yeah, the flashcards, yeah. They can do it pretty well. And they might even, you know, actually get an explanation from the teacher about what's going on. Um, and Chat GPT has seen millions of examples of arithmetic and hundreds or thousands of explanations of exactly how to do it. You know, here's the step-by-step -step recipe, here's the algorithm. You know, in every way you could possibly imagine, it's seen that explanation for how to do it, and it still can't do it. Yeah, you know, yeah. we think there are reasons for that, having to do with the fact that the transformer model is a circuit, and the algorithms for arithmetic are what we call recursive algorithms. So, to add up two very long numbers, you add up the first two digits you carry a number and then you add up all the other digits, right? So you call the same algorithm again to do the rest of the digits. It's very hard to implement that type of thing in a circuit. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's a fundamental limitation. And, and I would imagine that we may end up with specialized processes, much as computers have graphics cards and, and, and you know, specialized chips for different functions. And the human brain has evolved specialized regions to carry out different tasks. I, I think you say at one point in, in the book that, that the human brain is a circuit. You write at one point, every step towards an explanation of how the mind works is also a step toward the creation of the mind's capabilities in an artifact. That is a step towards artificial intelligence. So there's, a, there's an interesting connection here between what we understand about the human brain, which not unlike GPT-4, is sort of made out of the same stuff as much simpler animal brains, the same neurons and glial cells and you know same basic structure. Mm -hmm. But has developed we've developed these sort of emergent properties of, of 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 consciousness and cognitive capabilities that we're very impressed by <laughs> as you say at one point in the book the human brain you write is described by its owners as the most complex object in the universe <laughs> i love that described by its owners um but but there is a sense that at some scale of neurons right i mean i think lizards have typically like 5 million neurons dogs 500 million humans 86 billion Mm -hmm. And we've also evolved some specialized regions that do some special things, but that that we we do start to see these emergent capabilities at certain scales, right? And so I, I would imagine that even though there are all these limitations to the capabilities of LLMs today that you're describing, the reason that you're concerned and other experts are concerned about what we might see in the next 5, 10, 20 years 
is that we know that some of these problems about how they're storing information and some of the sort of clumsy and rudimentary aspects of how of how the LLMs are working, mm-hmm. there are ways to solve those problems, right? And make and make the way they store memory more efficient. And we can expect that these problems, or many of them anyway, will be surmounted. Is that is that accurate? I think so. It might mean a radical rethinking of the direction that the field has been going over the last 10 or 15 years. So circuits are a terrible representation for most of the concepts that, that you know humans can learn quite easily. So how, how is it that our brain, which as you correctly point out, is, is a circuit, manages to do this? And the answer is probably that what's happened with that circuit over evolutionary time is you know put and i'm putting this in a very you know big metaphorical quote marks in some sense the circuitry of our brain actually supports a higher level representation which is more like a programming language in the sense that it's very expressive and allows us to capture these general knowledge these general concepts uh, and patterns that are very difficult to express natively as a circuit. Interesting. Um, and and that allows us to to learn to understand language, to you know, to discover physics, to learn the rules of chess and arithmetic, and and lots of other things from very small numbers of examples. So circuits can do that, but only if they are recurrent circuits. Um, meaning that you know, there's two kinds of circuits: feed forward circuits and recurrent circuits. So feed-forward circuits, the signal comes in one end, it goes through the layers one by one, comes out the other end. And there are no connections that connect back to earlier layers in the network. So computers as circuits, like your laptop, they are recurrent circuits, and they, they need that recurrence so that they have memory, and so that they can keep track of where they are in the program, and, and so on. With recurrent circuits, of sufficient size, you can implement more expressive levels of representation, such as programming languages. Uh, and in fact, that's exactly what we do with our laptops. There yeah. is a recurrent circuit, and and then we have layers of representation on top of that, all the way up to uh, very expressive programming languages. So it seems that somehow the brain has figured this out, or, or there's actually a more sophisticated hypothesis still, which is not that the brain comes with that, but the brain comes with just enough so that when it grows up in the presence of other symbol-using humans, uh, then it develops this capability. So if the AI we have now has fundamental limitations, then we'll need some major breakthroughs if it's ever going to become a truly transformational technology. But if we do achieve those breakthroughs, if we're able to create super intelligent AI, What will it mean for the world? The answer, right after the break. Hi, I'm Jonathan Fields. Tune into my podcast for conversations about the sweet spot between work, meaning, and joy. And also listen to other people's questions about how to get the most out of that thing we call work. Check out Spark wherever you enjoy podcasts. You have a significant portion of the book describing the marvelous things we may be able to achieve with AI. You quote Nick Bostrom, who says at the end of his book, Superintelligence, success in AI will yield a civilizational trajectory that leads to a compassionate and jubilant use of humanity's cosmic endowment. <laughs> That's a, that sounds pretty good. Uh, how, how do, how do we, pretty good. Yeah. yeah how, how do we get to this jubilant use of, of humanity's cosmic endowment? What Nick Buster means by the cosmic endowment is is he he's talking about the potential for the human race to expand across the universe and to basically grow in size by my many orders of magnitude beyond the you know relatively puny population of the Earth compared to what it could be if we occupied the galaxy and and the many eventually many galaxies. He's very concerned that we not squander that possibility 
by messing things up right here and now on Earth and, and bringing an end to human civilization. So how does AI help with this, uh, you know, this jubilant use of the endowment? Because really, if you think about our civilization, if you think about the technology we're using now to talk to each other, you know, the houses we live in, or, you know, the, the food systems that support us, everything that makes life for many people on Earth, certainly not a majority by any means, but for many people on Earth, life is, is pretty good and, and would be envied by the kings and emperors uh, of many past centuries. This is all the product of our intelligence. And so if we had access to a lot more intelligence in the form of AI, we could just have a much better civilization. You know, and I would say that a lot of the media conversation about this seem very, very pedestrian. They, you know, Mark Zuckerberg says, oh, you know, we could use AI to reduce medical errors, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. I mean, which is yeah. fine, very sure. important, but that's yeah. hardly, you know, a, a, you know, a complete revolution in our civilization. Uh, and it's not the jubilant endowment that Nick Bostrom is talking about. Yeah, It would be things more like enabling every child to have a really high quality individual tutor mm -hmm. um, who helps them become the best that they can be that would be my that would be my choice for the the most important thing we could do in the next decade with ai and i i like that you say within the next decade so this is i mean the the, the current technology is not too far it seems from being able to be a, a an exceptional tutor i think that's right and and some organizations like the Khan Academy are already developing versions of large language models. And, you know, I spoke at the UNESCO uh, Digital Learning Conference a few weeks ago, and I think there's a willingness among many, many governments to, to give this a try. So I'm cautiously optimistic that we're actually going to do that. So then you've got um, science, and we're already seeing really dramatic advances in science coming from the use of AI, the protein folding results from DeepMind being the probably the best example. That was a problem that had been open in, in science and, and clearly recognized as of enormous importance for 50 years or more. And, and it just means, you know, given the amino acid sequence of a protein, how do you figure out the shape that that, that string of amino acids is going to fold up into to make a protein? that carries out some particular function in the body. And um, until we figured out how to do it using AI, each protein required basically a whole PhD worth of research to try to figure out its structure. To a reasonable extent, that problem is basically solved now. And biologists are like kids in a candy store you know, the candy store has been locked for the last 50 years and suddenly we let them in and they're just grabbing the candy, you know, f using the these predicted models of proteins to answer all kinds of questions about biology. And that's that's really exciting. I think you say at one point in the book that it's conceivable that most all diseases could be cured with su sufficient AI capabilities. My favorite prediction of possible benefits from your uh, from AI in your book is you talk about the opportunity to raise the living standards of everyone on earth to the level of reasonably well-to-do Americans in the 88th percentile, which is, I looked it up, it's close to $200,000 a year of income, household income. This would require a tenfold increase in global GDP. You say that this could be achieved without revolutionary new technologies, but through the ability of AI systems to deploy what we already have more effectively and at a greater scale. Um, so do you, you, you see that as achievable uh, over the course of uh, a number of decades? Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I do say politics and economics aside, right? So, yeah. so clearly there's going to be a lot of discussion about how it happens and who it happens to and when it happens. But the basic idea is that if, if we have general purpose AI, then by definition it can do any of the intellectual or physical tasks that human beings can do. So that would include, you know, being able to control robots to do surgery or, you know, pick strawberries or whatever it might be. 
And with our current technologies and humans, we're able to deliver a good standard of living to to several hundred million people, getting on cl- close to a billion now. I think would would say this would would meet that standard of a decent standard of living. But we can't at the moment extend that to the rest of the world. And the reason is not that it's technologically impossible because we know how to do it already. The reason is that it's too expensive to do a lot of the things that we do to generate the standard of living requires the time and energy of lots of very expensive human beings. So if you live in a nice house, it's because an architect designed it and then a construction engineer supervised the the construction and lots of skilled artisans did the bricklaying and the plumbing, the electrical and all the rest of that stuff. And then there has to be the infrastructure of electricity supply and water and sewage and roads and all the rest of it. And that can't be replicated using expensive human beings in countries where there are not the resources. Um, And just to give you a sense of the disparity in resources, I was looking up some numbers for healthcare budgets. And in, I think it's in Chad, the annual healthcare budget per person is $9. Wow. Which in in some places in, in Europe and the US doesn't even get you a cup of coffee. Uh, yeah. So yeah. The, the disparity is vast and there's no possibility that, that Chad could afford all those architects and engineers and, and plumbers and electricians to come and build houses for everybody. But if you had AI systems that don't need to be paid, uh, yeah, operating yeah. robots that uh, can work 24-7 and you know they need some, you know, there's some materials going into it and so on. And materials are not going to be free, but the cost is vastly reduced. And we can we can really do this. We can really deliver at least the material benefits of a decent mm-hmm. standard of living mm-hmm. for everyone on earth. Of course, the flip side of almost every one of the positive scenarios there tends to be a negative one. Like if we think about like advances in understanding biology could could cure diseases, but also make it possible to create superbugs and AI assistance that could make everybody more effective and potentially happier. AI, AI psychologists could also manipulate us. As you pointed out, there often we've already seen unintended consequences from the deployment of of early stage machine learning in terms of the the Facebook and YouTube algorithms that have been surprisingly effective at capturing attention, and that has had the consequence of you write quote the resurgence of fascism, the dissolution of the social contract that underpins democracies around the world, potentially the end of the European Union and NATO. Uh, you write not bad for a few lines of code. Now imagine what a really intelligent algorithm would do. You know, so you mentioned capturing attention, and, and that's certainly one of the phenomena. But the manipulation of human beings, changing who we are solely for the purpose of being able to monetize us. And let me expand on that a little bit, right? So these are algorithms that are designed to maximize some metric like clicks or engagement that corresponds pretty closely to revenue for the platforms. And how do you maximize clicks, for example? Well, we we learn pretty soon that there's a thing called clickbait. And uh, and the algorithms learn that when you send people clickbait, they click on it. And it doesn't matter to the algorithm that you're then disappointed or annoyed because you keep falling for it anyway. And so they keep doing it. So amplification of clickbait, amplification of of disinformation, because if you're willing to write false stories with false headlines, you have a vastly greater freedom of choice about what story to send, right? If you have to write the truth, you're kind of stuck with the truth, even if it's boring. But when you can write anything you want, you know, then you've got much more freedom and you can actually write things that are much more likely to get clicked on than true stories. And so we found that disinformation is amplified by the algorithm. But I think what's really going on is is not just that it learns to send you the next thing that you're most likely to click on, but it actually figured out that by sending 
certain sequences of content. Mm -hmm. Imagine, mm -hmm. let's say, videos that are increasingly violent, that it changes you into a different person. Someone who's very, let's say, addicted to violence and who actually needs increasingly violent videos in order to be satisfied, and but becomes then a very predictable consumer of certain types of content. So the algorithm doesn't care whether you like violence or whether you like you know, videos about grass growing. All it cares about is that it can make you into a more predictable consumer so that then it will be able to generate lots of clicks forever. And our hypothesis, a working hypothesis among many machine learning researchers who thought about this is, is that the algorithms are actually learning to manipulate humans over time. Uh, the problem is we don't have access to the internal data of the platforms to actually measure that effectively. So this is an early warning, I would say, right? That when you build systems that are pursuing these fixed objectives, and the fixed objectives are not the same objective as we want the future for the human race to be the to be great, the you know jubilant endowment and all that. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. if, if the objectives are not aligned with that, then you're actually setting up a conflict where the AI systems are harming humans, deviating from the future that we want, and as they become more intelligent, it's going to be less and less possible for us to prevent that from happening. As I think of it, there are kind of two levels of threat here. There's 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 sort of the, you know, we're going from machine learning with a goal of capturing attention, which we've seen in the in the you know YouTube and Facebook mm -hmm. algorithms that has has really destabilized uh, you know uh, our society. Um, and, and coming next, arguably, machine learning with a goal of establishing intimacy, right? Uh, uh, you know, tailored to each individual, which could could potentially have an even higher le level of potency uh, for destabilization. And among solutions for these problems, you you've mentioned like the importance of of, of saying that AI should always identify itself as such, which I think of as AI cowbells. <laughs> right, we like we, we should always know when we're interacting with AI, yep. um, which, which I think the EU has has passed regulation to that effect, but that's not has not yet happened in the U.S. Yep, I mean that's that's a I would say is there a bare minimum warm up exercise for legislators, yes. right? Just remind yourself, you know, wake up those long unused regulatory muscles, at least <laughs> yeah. at least yeah. give us that right, um, right, that there will be clear identification. But as you say, you know, a system can identify itself in a, as an AI system, but still be incredibly good at developing yes. that intimate personal relationship with you to the point where you may actually exclude humans from your social circle because humans don't give you as much positive feedback and good vibes. And the AI system is very good at making you feel good about yourself and, and all the rest of it. Which isn't intrinsically bad, but it's I, I think it is intrinsically bad on a social scale if humans start separating from each other. And we have to be really careful about that. Right. So I think one could also say not only should they identify themselves as AI, but they should av avoid both sort of superficial aspects like the nature of the voice, uh, you know, perhaps a, a, yeah. a virtual appearance. Uh, that it looks exactly like a human being, and also maybe some of the psychological manipulation, uh, which is more difficult to define. But I, I think we we need to start figuring out what is and what is not okay for AI systems to be doing to us. Yeah, and and as you say, you've been working on this this question of how we address the alignment problem. How do we keep AI aligned with our interests? Because there's a certain set of problems. That you, you know uh, that could be highly destabilizing that we've been discussing that are conceivable just with the technology we already have. We already have deep fakes. We already have misinformation. We can expect those things to accelerate. But if we imagine the emergence of superintelligence, as you point out, there's not a great track record of more intelligent species treating less intelligent species in a way that benefits the less intelligent species over long periods of time, <laughs> right? Or, so, or more to the point, there's not a good track record of less intelligent species controlling more intelligent yes, species. Uh, precisely, right. Forever, which is what we need to have in this case. 
Yeah. And so, and so you lay out three principles for beneficial machines, ways that we can get uh, AI, that, that we can build AI that's, that's more humble in its outlook. Do you want to share those? Sure. So we already talked about the fact that the social media algorithms are causing havoc because they're pursuing these fixed objectives that turn out not to be aligned with you know general societal benefit. And, um, and this happens over and over again in, in AI because we, we typically build our algorithms to take a fixed objective as the input and then optimize for that objective and then carry out the, you know, the plan that achieves the objective. And it sounds like a perfectly reasonable thing to do. And in fact, we do the same thing in, uh, in lots of other disciplines, control theory, economics, um, statistics, operations, research, and so on. So it sounds like a reasonable model, but when you try to specify objectives in the real world, not not on the simulated chessboard where, you know, checkmate is a reasonable objective, you know, not in, in closed environments, let's say, you know, the heating system in your home where, you know, a stable temperature is a reasonable objective. But in the broader environment, for example, how should you run a corporation? You know, how should you think about public policy for a government? How should you manage the you know the food system of a country or how should you manage climate engineering systems to keep uh, earth in a, in a stable condition these are all questions where defining the objective is really really difficult so there is something that we want them to do which is almost by definition we want them to bring about the future that we want but they're going to have to start out not knowing what that is, not knowing what is the future that we want. What is our preference ranking, if you like, over all the futures that could exist? And so if the system knows that it doesn't know what our preferences are, then it turns out that we avoid some of these pathological behaviors where the system is pursuing this incorrect objective and and preventing us from interfering because it knows that it's got the right objective and it's pursuing it. Instead, as you, as you mentioned, the system is humble, right? It says, well, I have this idea for how we might fix, you know, the climate, but it turns the oceans into sulfuric acid. Is that okay? Right? It's going to ask permission because it doesn't understand our preferences about the oceans. And then we can say, no, actually, it's not okay. <laughs> uh, we don't want the oceans turned into sulfuric acid. And then it updates its, uh, its understanding of our preferences. And so this, this behavior of asking permission cannot be exhibited by the systems that have a fixed known objective because they know that what they're doing is right, even if they're wrong about it. And so they'll never ask permission. And in the extreme case, the systems that are built on the principles that I suggest in the book will actually want to be switched off if we want to switch them off. Because, you know, we want to switch them off because they're about to do something that we don't want. And they don't want to do something that we don't want because they want to bring about the future that we do want. They don't know what it is that we do and don't want. But if we want to switch them off, then they want to be switched off because they want to avoid doing that thing that would cause us to want to switch them off. And that sort of sounds like common sense, and we can actually turn that into some mathematical theorems proving that the system will have a positive incentive to allow us to switch it off as long as it's uncertain about what future we want. So there's this direct correlation between the uncertainty that the system has about our preferences, provided that it's keyed, you know, that the first principle, it has to bring about the future that we want. So given those two principles, we can show that we actually retain control. And there's this direct connection between uncertainty about our preferences and our ability to retain control over the system, in particular, to be able to switch it off. So qualitatively, this direction, I think, has the promise of allowing us to build super intelligent systems 
that are guaranteed to be safe and beneficial. But there's a huge amount of work still to do before we can realize that potential. Here's the problem. As Seward just said, there's still a huge amount of work to do before we can safely build super intelligent AI. Yet the most powerful companies in the world are racing to build AGI anyway. After the break, we discuss the obvious risks of this approach and whether there's still enough time to contain AI before it develops beyond our control. Hey folks, Rufus here. If you're a fan of our interviews with physicians, scientists, or entrepreneurs, then I have the perfect podcast recommendation for you, Raising Health. Previously called BioEats World, Raising Health comes from leading venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz, A16Z. Each episode, Raising Health dives deep into the heart of healthcare, biotech, and AI with A16Z general partners. Along the way, they explore the real challenges and opportunities in health and biotech entrepreneurship. Not to mention, you'll hear raw insights and actionable advice from notable guests like Omada CEO and co-founder Sean Duffy, an AI expert and in Citro CEO Daphne Kohler. Don't miss out. Follow Raising Health wherever you get your podcasts. You've said that we should not build AGI until we've already figured out how to contain it. AGI being artificial general intelligence, super intelligence. Yep. Do you think that these principles that your team has worked on are an adequate containment system that makes you feel that we are ready to proceed building AGI? Or, or do you feel like there is more work to be done to make sure that we have the right containment system and that we should not be as many companies are today, pursuing the goal of AGI? I absolutely think we're not ready. What we're doing now with large language models is sort of analogous to saying, you know, okay, we know that we can generate nuclear energy by collecting together large amounts of enriched uranium. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and sometimes it blows up in, in the form of a huge nuclear explosion. And so we figure, okay, yeah, we, we probably going to need some type of method of containing it, but we don't know what that is yet. So let's just start collecting the enriched uranium, put it in a big pile. Um, and then we'll figure out how to contain the explosion, right? That's just the, the wrong order to do things. Yeah. And, and, you know, interestingly, when Leo Zillard, who I, I talk about a bit in the book, he's, He's the person who figured out how to generate nuclear energy. He figured out the idea of a nuclear chain reaction that was mediated by neutrons. And that was the key idea that led to the nuclear age. And it gets kind of actually uh, almost made invisible in the Oppenheimer film. Um, he does appear briefly, but in fact, I think he's really the person who had the idea. And he had the idea of crossing the road, right? And and by the time he got to the other side of the road, he would already started thinking about how do we contain this nuclear reaction so that we can get useful energy out without having a huge explosion. And he actually patented a contained nuclear reactor that, but you know, the following year, 1934, before wow. anyone had ever actually achieved a nuclear reaction of any kind. Uh, he had already figured out the containment solution. And that containment solution basically continues today. And the containment solution is essentially that the reactor contains something that sustains the reaction. But as soon as the reaction starts to, to get too hot, the thing that sustains the reaction disappears and then the reaction automatically cools down again. And, and so you're able to maintain it subcritical level. You know, we don't have anything like that yet. I, you know, I've made a proposal, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of work to do on my proposal. And yet we're just plunging ahead towards AGI. And the particular methods of training these giant circuits are not really amenable to any control method uh, that I can see. And they try. There are various methods that have been applied, such as something called reinforcement learning from human feedback. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really papering over what is fundamentally an unaligned 
uh, AI system that is very unpredictable and uh, you know may even be pursuing some internal objectives and we don't even know what they are. So that's the situation we're currently in. So we're a bunch of, uh, we have a bunch of nuclear scientists plowing forward with uh, detonation without having built containment, <laughs> containment uh, uh, capabilities. Uh, is, this is pretty alarming. And as you point out, the majority of the problem of, of building nuclear reactors is the containment and is the safety. It's, it's, it's like more than 50% of, of the job uh, of, of, of executing that. And, and, and we should have that approach as we think about building AGI. You've said um, the history of AI has been driven by a single mantra, the more intelligent, the better. I'm convinced that this is a mistake. If you had a magic wand, would you halt the progress of AI today? Would you, what, what would you do if you were in a position to make, make the, the, the call for the world? So I, I think it's extremely hard to halt research on AI. Well, remember though, you have a magic wand. Uh, <laughs> well, if I, if I really had a you know a magic one as opposed to just yeah, being yeah. the supreme overlord of the earth, uh, I I would say there there is this upside you know this huge upside for AI and if I could wave my wand and guarantee that the AI systems we build would be safe and beneficial, I would do that. And here, but here's an interesting point: if it's the case that there is not a beneficial form of coexistence between humans who are likely to remain sort of roughly the same as we are now uh, and AI systems that are arbitrarily more capable than us. If there is no really beneficial form of coexistence, then the AI systems themselves will take themselves out of the situation. They'll say, you know what, humans? We love you, but we're not good for you. Uh, this is really about me, not you, as they say. Uh, and, and, they will, <laughs> and they will leave, right? They will say, okay, we're, we're out of here. You must actually figure out how to manage your civilization yourself. And it's just not good for you to keep passing it on to us. You know, look at what's happening. You know, it might be the Wall-E world, right? Where everyone is enfeebled and infantilized and and sort of like spoil babies. And we're probably going to say, no, don't go, right? We're going to start and stop the AI systems from leaving because we got so used to all the great things they do for us. But, you know, sometimes, as happens with our children, at some point, it's time for them to leave the house and manage by themselves. And, uh, and the same is true, same may be true for humans. Uh, you know, if there is a beneficial form of coexistence, then fine. The AI systems will will be part of that beneficial coexistence. But if there isn't, uh, they will leave. Uh, yeah, to end on an optimistic note, we do have a history of, of, of successfully regulating dangerous technologies, as you pointed out. We've done it with, with nukes, cloning, cars, and 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 you've uh, laid out a, a sensible roadmap here to do it with, with AI. Thank you, Stuart, for being with us today. It's, it's been a, a fascinating conversation. Thanks, Rufus. I really enjoyed it. Stuart Russell is a professor of computer science at Berkeley and the author of Human Compatible, Artificial Intelligence and the Problem of Control. As I mentioned at the top, we're hard at work developing AI tools that we believe will transform the next big idea app, helping learners like you unlock the ideas that are trapped in books. If that sounds like something that you might be interested in, go ahead and download the Next Big Idea app. We're rolling out these new tools in a few weeks. In the meantime, if you download our app now, you can hear the conversations I've had about AI with Kevin Roos, David Chalmers, Steven Johnson, and Cade Metz. And the best part, all you have to do to access this treasure trove of knowledge is go to your app store and search for the Next Big Idea. If you like this show, recommend it to a friend. And if you really like this show, leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Today's episode was produced by Caleb Bissinger, sound designed by Mike Toda. If AI does take over the world, we hope our computer overlords will still let us make this show with the team at the LinkedIn Podcast Network because we love working with them. I'm Rufus Griscom. See you next week.